Good evening and uh, welcome to the second edition of the Happiness Conversations. We have uh, Vidya Singh who has joined us this evening. Thank you Vidya for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Pleasure. It's lovely to um, see some known faces and there are some new people. Uh, I'll start first with of course uh, thanking um, Ashwin of Odissi and Team Odissi led by Parandaman and Vinod here who uh, have been able to consistently support all that Vani and I do in the space of uh, curated uh, conversations over here. We do this and we do another one. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know us, this is Vani, my soulmate, and my name is Davis, and we are the Happiness Wallas. Our life's purpose is inspiring happiness. Uh, going through a very, very difficult time in life in the past decade, uh, about 11 years now, we have understood that life can be faced, life can be lived while being in a crisis. There is a possibility to face life through a crisis and you can face it with equanimity, you can face it with a phenomenal amount of happiness. Now you may wonder how is that possible? How is that really possible that you can be happy living through a crisis? So let me quickly explain how we uh, understood this basic truth about life while introducing the program. Let me try and set the context of happiness as we define it. So to us both, happiness is first of all learning the art of being non-worrying. You see, problems fall under two categories in life. A problem that you can solve and a problem that you can't solve. You can't solve. Maybe somebody else can, but you can't solve it. And sometimes problems fall under a category where they cannot be solved and time has to heal. So in the first category, there's no point worrying because you have a solution. You know how to solve the problem. And in the second category, there is no need to worry because you can't solve it yourself. And so you let go. So the first thing that we learned was the art of non-worrying. The second thing we learned was to be non-frustrated. You know, we all like to put in our efforts and we think that just because we are putting the efforts, we must get the results that we want, that we expect. And we discovered that we only have a right to our actions, not to the outcomes. And so we learned, we cultivated the art of being non-frustrated. The third thing we learned was not to be suffering, which is to be non-suffering. Now when do we suffer? When there is pain, we suffer. But actually, the pain was never in our hand. Pain was inflicted on us by someone, by life, by a context, by a situation. Our suffering, however, is our own invention. Why? Because we ask the question, why? Why is the pain there in the first place? Why did this person do this to me? Why me? I am good, I am ethical, I am hardworking, I am truthful. And why is this happening to me? So when you ask that, the pain doesn't disappear. But because the pain continues to stay there, you suffer. And so we learned to drop that question, why? We stopped asking, why me? And we learned to be non-suffering. Now think about it. When you are non-worrying, non-frustrated and non-suffering, you can only be happy. That is the true state of happiness that we discovered. So going through a decade-long bankruptcy, which means for the longest time in the past 11 years, Vani and I have survived in this city without work and without money. When I say without money, I mean penniless at some points in this past decade. It's been cathartic, a lot of pain, but we learned to be non-worrying, non-frustrated and non-suffering. And so we decided we can be useful by sharing our learnings. So I wrote this book, Fall Like a Rose Petal, which talks about the journey that we as a family went through. We have two children who are now young adults, but at that time they were in their teens when all this started. And so I wrote this book. We started delivering talks, We started. I started writing a blog and sharing my learnings through the blog with people. 
uh, we we transformed our business model and we became a birthplace happiness firm, inspiring managers to be happy. And through all of this, we also started curating conversations in public spaces like this, where we bring people like Vidya we have today, we've been bringing people in conversation with the two of us, through whose journeys we explore the idea of happiness. You know, I'm reminded of this movie that we saw recently. To me, it's a forgettable Rajnikanth movie. Uh, it, might, it might upset some hardcore Rajnikanth fans. I'm not a fan of Rajnikanth, the actor, but I'm a great fan of Rajnikanth, the man. And in the whole movie, Peter, the one line that appealed to me the most and will stay in my memory till I die is Kharand Pordada Varika. Right in the middle of the movie, he and Simran exchange a conversation, have a conversation where he says, To pass through life is life. You have to pass through it. And some of it will be a high, and some of it will be lows that you never planned for, never anticipated, and yet you were given. And so this series, The Happiness Conversations, is in celebration of that thought which came in the better movie, which is living fully with what is. If you think about it very carefully, all your unhappiness, all your suffering comes from what could have been. Anger, grief, guilt comes from what could have been. And all your fear, worry, insecurity comes from what it may be, but in what is, in this moment, there is only equality, there is only one reality, and you are embracing that reality. When you embrace that reality, the truth about your life, you end up being happy, because you are not worrying at that time, you are not frustrated, and you are not suffering. So this conversation series is really about bringing people to share their lived experiences with us. The format we have is that we will be in conversation with Vidya for about, about an hour, uh, 65 minutes. I'm timing it here so we will stay within that time. And then we'll have a 10 minute Q&A with you uh, asking her questions, asking us questions. And we'll end sharp, as we started at 7, we'll end sharp at 8.29 p.m. So thank you Vidya for joining us. Uh, I'll let Vani take it forward here. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, I just want to uh, tell you how we met Vidya. Uh, it's really strange, uh, we uh, know of Vidya uh, because she's a socialite and uh, that's the worst word to use. <laughs> yeah, so I would, I would so see you that. in phase 3, that's where I would see you. She, and, she's, she's talking about how we got to know And uh, once I, I have this very distinct memory, we were walking in boat club and uh, I think I saw you walk past. Uh, with a Harvard mom um, t-shirt and I looked at uh, you and I told him, is that Vidya Singh? Uh, he said, yeah, that's Vidya Singh and of course, uh, you're always an inspiration for uh, fitness and stuff like that. Thank you. So I was like, okay, I want to be like her someday and uh, yeah, I continued my walk and though I didn't jog. Uh, but uh, the, the time when uh, we really sat up to take notice of your story was uh, when we read this uh, beautiful article, uh, I think it was by Sahitya in uh, DP Next. And she, um, she actually wrote a very sensitive piece. Very sensitive piece on your story and uh, I read it and I said, I, I didn't know these things about India. I mean, looking at you, one would never say that, you know, this is what you've been through. Uh, so I uh, I said to Avis, uh, the next time I see Vidya, I'm going to pick up the courage and go talk to her. So that's what I did when I saw you in Paramudit Chole, of all places. She's buying vegetables and we are buying vegetables. And I walk up to her and say, hi Vidya, my name is Vani. And I introduce myself. And yeah, we talk about the vegetables that we are buying. And uh, yeah, that's how we became friends. And, and what was interesting was when I got into the auto rickshaw back to get back home uh, with, with what we had bought, I, I remember telling Vani, 
she actually spoke to us. So uh, at one level, you have this, you hear this, uh, you know, very very successful wedding planner, uh, very aesthetic uh, wedding planner, uh, the princess of a former royal royal family. family uh, you know, you hear this uh, lives in Botla and appears in Paisley. Okay, I'm sorry to say that, but <laughs> the last part of it is not your doing. You just happen to be uh, in, in, in places where they take your pictures because you're. No, I think we should say that you happens around her. Yeah. <laughs> so we said she's so down to earth, and Sahitya's story was there of how uh, overnight she found that she had been betrayed, that she had been, uh, you know, left high and dry with a whole lot of uh, debt. And at the end of it all, uh, she was left with dealing with all of it. So it wasn't just as if uh, somebody walked away from her life. It was that she had to face that situation and start working on fixing it. And all through this time, let's say between 2010 and today, this is the time when we actually got to know you as well. We we realized that there is absolutely no bitterness. Uh, she's always smiling, she's always very, very dignified and uh, very, very down to earth, like that conversation that Paramudhi Chole. And so he said, Vidya, we must have you on the show whenever we do it. And so here we are. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to start with the first uh, question for the evening. Uh, when we hear you about your story, uh, when we meet you, uh, we don't notice any bitterness. <coughs> so, I, I want to ask you a more deeper philosophical question to start with. Uh, what is your outlook to life, particularly through having been betrayed, uh, through having to deal with a crisis of such proportion? It must have taught you some lessons. So, what, what is your outlook to life and what is the secret behind your being so calm and composed through this? I think it's, a, it's not a huge secret. I think it's just a question of having a, a very positive outlook, which is what I am, a very positive and I'm basically a happy person. I've made myself happy despite all these various things that happen. And I think you have to just... Shit happens, I'm sorry to use the word, but shit happens to everybody. There's not a single person in this world that has not been touched by some kind of tragedy. I mean, could, like my son said at my worst state when I was in my weeping days, he turned around to me and said, Mom, it's just material things. Forget it, it's gone. But we are living here ourselves, we are together, we have got our health, and we, we're not on the street, so what else do we need? I thought that was a very uh, philosophical statement for a young man. 10 years ago, I mean, he was not that young, in his early 30s, to say to me. And fortunately for me, like I said to you earlier, uh, God's grace that neither of my kids pointed a finger at me and said, because of what you did, we lost a fortune and our entire inheritance. So the, I think I was very blessed to have those two children uh, standing by me. And uh, I, I thought that was a, I mean, that gives you the courage. Also, we had friends, very close friends and family who just rallied behind us. I mean, I never imagined that I'm a princess of a royal family, grew up in pri very privileged and with everything you could possibly imagine. I never imagined there'd be a day in my life when I wouldn't have a home. And it was uh, extraordinary. I mean, you've been through it yourself. And so it was, uh, there are people who, Mrs. Preeta Reddy, who's my very dear friend, said, Vidya, I have an apartment in MRC, you just go stay there. I don't want you to worry about anything. Somebody like someone left you, somebody, my mother left me a car. So we just, we just picked up the strings and carried on and fortunately I had the ability to settle our debts, what was on my children's head and which was again fraud by that man. The rest of the debts I just said I'm sorry, I had nothing to do with it and we just stepped back. But this itself was a good 8 crores of rupees which for me as a just a very ordinary person I just certainly didn't have that kind of money. We had to sell properties but I think we got on with life so I think that was the most important thing. We got along with life. I think that's a that's yeah. a very very important point there to take away. And the I outlook the outlook comes from that. From that, right? and like my son said, we don't have to deal with health issues. I think that's far worse if you had somebody who died, a very close person who died, or you're in an accident, you lose your. I have a very dear friend whose son was in a terrible car accident and cannot walk. It's been 20 years, and the poor child, same age as my son, is in a wheelchair. 
So actually speaking, we are we are pretty blessed with life itself. I think so. I think that's the way to look so at things. Overall positive outlook to life. Absolutely. A, a sense of counting your blessings. Yes. Looking at the at the, yeah. the more harmonious side of it, the more abundant side of it. And I think I'm uh, you know I'm, those of uh, you who who are regulars here will love this uh, uh, this line from Rumi, uh, which uh, my who is my favorite poet, uh, who says that. Take sips of the pure wine being poured. Take sips of the pure wine being poured. Don't mind that you've been given a dirty cup. The pure wine here is life. It's the abundance, it's the friends, it's the family, it's the good health. That's the pure wine being poured. The act of betrayal, the act of bankruptcy, okay, the state of bankruptcy, that's the dirty cup. In somebody else's case, it can be uh, cancer, can be the death of a dear one. So we sometimes look at the cup and complain. And I think the, the, the beauty of life is the moment you turn your complaining mind into a non-complaining one, if you teach your mind not to complain, you will be happy. And that's the state that she's talking about. That's I, I think that, that is one thing. And the second thing I think is to have at that time or in your life, you know, a, a sense of discipline with what, the way you live your life. I think I'm a person, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I exercise every day. So it gives you certain, uh, certain regimented paths to do. You have to get up in the morning, you have to go to exercise, you have, you have to work. And I suddenly realized if I don't work, I, I can't eat or live. I needed to work. I never imagined there'd be a day in my life when I actually have to work for a living. Actually, never, never imagined that would, that would come. But I'm glad for it. We have, I run a very, very successful wedding planning business, which we started a few years before this disaster came. Uh, so, question for you, uh, Vidya, is I'm sure. I mean, you had absolutely no inkling that this was happening. What? I mean, you, uh, that's not quite true. This fellow um, was uh, I mean, married to was married to me, but. Through the years, he was always a bit of a bit, bit shady. He used to used to be cheating other people all the time. And as far as my properties are concerned, people would say, "How stupid could you have been?" That is true. I was stupid. I think we are brought up very naive and very sheltered. So you trust people. You don't expect your husband, to, your own husband, to crook you. That's the last thing. I mean, he, he may be a crook and may crook other people. I'm sure other other people are like that, but somehow this fellow married me only because I had properties and estates and I think the reason he stayed so long is because I have that much for him to cheat and he couldn't do it like in a week or something, it took him that many years. <laughs> so I think that's the reason it's it's very uh, and So when you saw it coming, you didn't see it coming? Right? We didn't, see, like he would, uh, there would be a property that he would say let's sell it and then I would say yeah, yeah, he would convince me that was the right thing to do. I would sign the papers maybe and then Where's the money? I never thought to ask. I presumed that he was investing it somewhere. So suddenly, over a period of time, we woke up and found that every property of mine was just had slowly just vanished. Over the I think it would have been probably 300 crores worth of uh, my personal properties, money, jewelry. So I mean, it may not be a large sum for a Dhirubhai Ambani or, or someone of that level, but for someone like me, that that was what my I would have lived down in so my this, children. This was. This was in a systematic manner. Very eroded. systematic, very systematic, and I was uh, more traumatized. I was traumatized throughout all of that, but I think the minute the day he left, we just walked out of the house and never came back. It's been nine years now, and we never saw him. And I suddenly was left with having to deal with all these various deaths that he left around. And so it must have been like a shock, uh, you know, especially when you came to understand the magnitude, magnitude of yeah. what you were left with. Yeah. And uh, you know, not having been really a person who was either working or taking care of the uh, money, the investments and things like that, all of a sudden you would have not known what hit you and what was happening. What was the it's a, it's a, a, it's a, it's a learning lesson. Uh, it's a learning lesson for other women, I think. I don't know so much about men, but for women that you, you need to ask questions. If somebody sends you a check to sign, I used to just blindly sign the check and send it back, you know, to him. Then uh, somehow we never thought that the sense of trust was so much. So 
So it was just that sort of thing I was telling them. I, I had never looked at a bank statement in my life. I never en really even entered the bank except to open my locker to take out jewelry. I don't think I bothered. And the first time I saw a bank statement after this fellow ran away, I thought CR was crores. I didn't realize it. I mean, that's stupid. I, I, don't, I don't look like a stupid person, but if you look at me, I'm quite smart and all of that. But having said that, you are, you are naive. A lot of people are naive. You don't... I'm sure a lot of women are like me. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just uh, being trusting and simple and feeling that you don't really need to look at that somebody else is taking care of it. So the magnitude was eight crores uh, in terms no, of debt. In terms of debt, that's because he had forged my children's signature and taken a bank from a loan from State Bank of India. Now the banks are quite happy to fund Vijay Malia for six thousand crores, but when it was a, a small person like me, they came after me for that money. So, it was, so over 300 crores was eroded and you were so left with the debt. And uh, all of that. All he of took that. all the jewellery I had. He took uh, 60, 70 kilos of silver. Jewellery worth at least uh, 20 crores or 25 crores worth of jewellery. All ancestral jewellery from Vijayanagara. So wow. all of it. So you tend to... And, and left you the debt burden. Debt burden. Which was not really yours. Absolutely was nothing on, to do on with us. Forge, on we, went, we went to the chairman of the bank to plead our cause. But of course not even one rupee that they waive off the interest either. So luckily I had a friend, Mrs. Mr. Ramesh Reddy. I always say it's good to have somebody like that as your big brother is, uh, looking over you. Chaitanya Ramesh Reddy. He just within an hour, I was short of a, a crore and a half or something. Sold the property and so on. He put a crore and a half in my bank in an hour. And uh, we cleared the debt with that. So there, fortunately, God's grace, there were people around me who out of the blue just, just stood up and, and gave you. a helping hand. We'll come to that, but I just yeah. want to pick up two learnings here. I think where the crisis hits, uh, many a time, like her story and our story is quite quite similar in the fact that we, we could have seen it coming, but we didn't see it coming. Uh, we were in that vantage position running a company ourselves and we didn't see it coming. So sometimes it just creeps up and gets you here. Now when it hits you, it numbs you. It can be very, very numbing and I'm going to ask her that question, but our experience was that it completely socked us, uh, shocked us and left us uh, speechless. If we, you know, she's 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 laughing already. I think in hindsight, life is only worth laughing. At. Okay, uh, so she's saying I don't look stupid, but you know, I did something very stupid. Like I trusted and I just blindly signed checks, and I think this happened to us as well. So in a way, of course, our our bankruptcy was driven by an ethical decision we had taken to separate with a customer. But uh, I I do do totally understand the the value of getting into the nitty gritty of what you're doing. If you're not getting into that nitty gritty, uh, you will be surprised and shocked. I just want to come in here, Elvis. Uh, Elvis and I have a very favorite interview of uh, Amitabh Bachchan that we watch often for inspiration. Uh, it's an interview that's on Elvis's YouTube channel. It's uh, He's talking to Reeve Sanghvi and he says in that uh, interview that uh, his all his properties were actually attached at one point in time. And uh, so Veer asks him, how did that happen? I mean, did you not ask them? Uh, you know, he said, we did not because we didn't know. People said, you just sign. And we didn't know that personal guarantees can actually be executed. People, people in the company asked us to sign and we just signed. And we didn't realize that at the end of the day, all our properties are actually going to be attached. And that's what happened to Amitabh Bachchan too. So I, you know, you're talking about this actually brought that vivid memory back to me. Uh, because I've watched that interview so many times that it, it just played back. But even if you have friends who can stand by you and family, I think that goes a very long way. So, but yeah. even before friends came in, I want to go to that time when you were completely shocked. Uh, I, I dealt with emotions, she dealt with emotions. And I think commonly we understand that anger over our stupidity anger over having been betrayed, grief over what you are having to deal with which is not exactly your doing, and guilt because some of the choices you make came haunting to you. So how did you deal with that time of anger, grief and guilt? Uh, did you feel depressed? Did you feel completely lost in life? How do you, uh, how, how, what were you going through? I think it's you get distraught with what's happened because you don't expect that you'll ever be in that position. You don't expect that, at least I felt in my 
state to where I was, where I was coming from. I never imagined that there would be a time like that. And I was completely distraught, weeping, crying. I was a, a complete basket case and a, a totally mess. And I'd be weeping on people's shoulders, complete random strangers. I would be telling them my life story. So fortunately, I had friends who said... How did it flip? How did it flip? I think it was just literally overnight, suddenly realizing I'm left alone with all of this and I've lost everything. So I think that was a huge... Uh, like a, something hitting you on your head with that and I, I certainly went through an emotional complete uh, uh, breakdown, meltdown. I was, I was telling you I was one day I was at uh, one of the Nilgiris or something and I was not sleeping at night, having anxiety attacks, uh, panic attacks, you know, racing heartbeat, ready and you know, thought of something and I was in Nilgiris and suddenly the whole store seemed like it was closing in on me sounds were becoming very loud and I just dropped the basket, got into my car and went back home. And then I was going up in uh, in the apartment lift where I was staying in MRC and I saw these two little children. And I just, for momentarily, I imagined these were the two little children of the girlfriend this fellow ran off with. And I wanted to beat up those children. It was such an intense feeling. So I went upstairs to my flat and I called my friend, Mariam Enram's wife, Mariam. And I said, Mariam, please help me. Something's happened. I've gone, I've gone crazy. You have to help me. Within 5-10 minutes, she was in my apartment. She took me to Vijay Nagaswami, put me there in front of Vijay and sat outside for that first one hour. After that, I went to Vijay for about 6 months, I think, with medication and, you know, so many things that he, a calming influence that he was. He's a, it's not like he's giving you some great yarn to, to immediately solve your problems, but I think it's that listening and also the medication certainly help because it puts you, you know, antidepressants and it puts you in a calmer place. There's something that makes you sleep at night so you don't have to wake up wired up and spend the whole night thinking about these things. So I think all of these, it took about six months and every day shouting at by Mariam shouting at me, stop it now, stop crying, there's nothing you can do about it, deal with life. My mother, I would, would call her every morning and cry and she's like, what's the point in crying? It's over. You did it to yourself. There's nobody else you can blame. Forget it. Just let's look forward. What do you do? What can you do? And Mariam told me one day, Vidya, okay, you've lost so much, but you're still only an impoverished ex-royal. You're not on the street. <laughs> so, you know, so people like this who are just telling you practical, sensible things to put you on track. So, mm -hmm. I think, I think the, the, look at the courage here to come out and say, that yes, I dealt with depression. I dealt with a serious situation where I didn't know what I was doing. And the role of the friend, now we often look for messages, we look for signs, and they come through other people to us. She heeded the sign. Many of us don't heed it sometimes. So that's the second thing that I, I, I see in the story. Marion Brown's role, her mother's role, these are all messengers. They're giving a message that pick, pick up your life, deal with it, face it. And I think the, the joy of, the beauty of life lies in the joy of the adventure. If you knew everything, that would be, it won't be fun. So when you're pushed in a, to a corner, then the choices you make, make your adventure very special and that's what she did. I'm reminded of uh, a very famous poet uh, that we were talking about the other day, uh, Mary Oliver, who passed away uh, last month. Mary Oliver uh, said, uh, that it is indeed, it is indeed uh, a great feeling to be alive on a fresh morning in this broken world. So beautiful. It is a great feeling to just be alive on a fresh morning in this broken world. So you can't fix the world. The morning is there. Fix yourself. And then Look at the sunrise, alive. I think. Look at the sunrise. Also, Absolutely. I think that uh, if you have children who are, are good kids, like my daughter one day turned around and told me, Mom, you didn't stand a chance. This fellow was such a crook that you actually <laughs> didn't stand a chance. You know, and she was also, it was such a comforting thing to hear that from her that it's not entirely my fault. Although I did it, I did everything, but it was not, the blame is not entirely on me. So that was a very comforting thing that she did say. And she said, Mom, at the end of the day, we're not living on the street. We still have our homes in Boat Club Road. We've got this, that, and the other. There's so much more that we still have. We couldn't take all of it, fortunately. So, I mean, another six months, I would, might have been on the street with a begging bowl. But till then, luckily, we saved, saved ourselves and got on with life. And I think my kids have been 
my complete backbone and strength and fortunately both of them have set, settled well and do, I'm not saying they're married, they're both unmarried but they settled marriage well. Marriage is no sign of being no settled. Sign, no sign of being settled, it could be a disastrous marriage too. But uh, they're, both, they're both extremely happy children doing things that they love doing. One is a, being my son being is a, happy is a sign being of being happy. settled. Yes, <laughs> being happy is more than enough. He's a cinematographer and my daughter started a little travel company called Girl with a Backpack and she's taking tours to South America. How fun, how, how fun is that? So that's really, uh, I think a very positive, a lot of positives came out of this. I think it made us very tight as a family, the three of us. In fact, for my 60th birthday, my children said, Mom, no birthday party for you, let's take you on a holiday. So they took me off to Tuscany and we went on a bicycling holiday for 10 days, up and down those hills. So I mean, so now all of us, all three of us are into sport and adventure and you know, things like that. So I think there's just too much of good things going on to worry about the past. And like Virat said, mom is hiding, that fellow's a, a slime and a rat, nobody has respect for him. He must be hiding in some hole in wherever he hid in Thailand for a few years and back in hiding somewhere in Bangalore. So I think we don't know where he is actually is uh, vanished and missing in, missing in action kind of thing. But you know, I think we have too much to look forward to and life is, is so good. That, um, that's, what, so. <laughs> that's amazing. No, that's, that's amazing. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I want to come to a question of the kid, uh, children. They're not kids, kids. They're, yes. For us, they're still kids. Children. children. So, uh, but I, I'll ask you about your friends. You did talk about your friends a few times. So, uh, what I see is that at every stage, your friends rallied around. Uh, at any time, did you... Uh, did you feel, so this question has got two parts. One, did you at, at all feel that some people were judging you because you were now in a different financial state than before, A? And B, uh, did you ever feel shy of asking for help? You know, fortunately, God's grace, in these 10 years, I've never had to ask anyone for a rupee. We had enough of our own to survive and uh, clear those debts. Ramesh Reddy is the only one, and he did it uh, as, a, as a loan, a proper loan, so that was a different matter, but we, I never needed to take a rupee from either of my parent, mother or anybody else. And I think it's a question of, when you're a little down and out, put your head down, don't go shopping, don't travel, and don't do things, don't eat out, you know, things like that. So I think it's very easy to, to cut your life down into a smaller size and, and still live very well. And, I think so and, and you also were, you know, you received help from people like Rita Reddy, you said. Uh, not uh, not financial help, but an apartment but to an stay apartment. in. Uh, Ramesh Reddy was the one. Manam Santalia, who was another dear friend, also sent me to an astrologer who, through whom I had quite an interesting experience. <laughs> so things like that, I think that it was just friends and family rallying around you, no question of judgment. And certainly not a question of uh, am I a poorer person today? I don't think anyone gives a damn. I mean, you know, except some some very superficial people, so who we don't really care for. I so, think the last last point you made is very very important. I'm just going to quickly amplify it and let Vani ask the next question, which is uh, judgment. Her experience is that she was not possibly judged at all. Our experiences, some of the people around us judged us very, very close. My own family, uh, my, my mother, my brother, my sister, they, they judged us and they passed judgment. And then, you know, you, you let it go because you know, you just move on and you don't, you don't uh, moan over it. Uh, the other thing is, what she's saying is the ability to uh, accept what comes your way, whether it's an apartment, whether it's a car, whether it's a... Uh, an advice, whether it's an hour from a friend, uh, whether it's a friendly loan, you take what comes your way because that is the universe's way of helping you along this crisis, along with this crisis. And don't, I have often seen, and we talk about it, that people sometimes say, oh no, no, no but how can I take help from other people? So it is, it is possibly the best thing to do, which is to be vulnerable, which is to wear your life on your sleeve, you are not poorer. That's a very important point. You're not poorer just because you've lost money or somebody has betrayed you or you don't have the uh, status that you once had. Okay, all these are material times. So you let them go and you just take the crisis and work, put your head down. That's a very important line she said. What must you do in this situation? 
go ahead and do that. That's what I'm fixing. Amazing. You could... I was driving back yesterday from, I was telling both of them this yesterday. So we were driving back from ECR and I was crossing the Muller Hospital, the Aviar Bridge, and the police stopped us. And I, there was, he was escorting a, one of the little women, like a dwarf. She was only this high. And I looked at her crossing the road slowly. Elder, she was not young, she was elderly with grey hair and things. And I thought to myself, what must her life be? How can we think of anything? I mean, we are privileged. We are still, we are still privileged despite anything that happened. We are born into different kinds of families. And I looked at her and I was actually a little traumatized for the, for the next few hours looking at this little woman and thinking, I should, none of us should ever complain about anything. We've got too many good things going on to complain. That, that was a, a thought that I had just yesterday. Was, and I think life, yes. life makes you very reflective, yes. right? Yeah, you know, uh, talking about um, seeking help and accepting help, uh, they are two different things. Uh, asking for help and even accepting what somebody has given you are two different things. Uh, I'll, I'll just explain this with, with an example. There's a friend of ours who's pretty much similar in the similar situation as us and she's in touch with us and we often share notes and stuff like that. So once she came and told me that there's a friend of hers who realized that she doesn't have money to buy her monthly uh, groceries. So the friend has offered her 10,000 rupees and said, you just go buy whatever you want. Uh, I'll come and swipe my card. It's 10,000 rupees. I can afford it. So let's go. But she says that she is not able to accept it because she cannot quote unquote accept anything from anyone else. Um, I just want to cut to another uh, thing that happened. Uh, we were in a, uh, I think it was a book launch or it was a fall like a rose petal talk that we did. And uh, one person in the audience stood up and said to me, uh, don't you think uh, Avis and you are extremely lucky? Yeah, we are very lucky. What do you mean? Uh, so uh, he said, uh, oh, but you know, uh, I don't think what happened to you would happen to others. I mean, people coming in, helping you with money, helping you with uh, fees for your children's college, uh, helping you with a place to stay. Um, I don't think this happens to everybody around you. And so you guys are just extremely lucky. I said, well, what do you know? We are very lucky. And who has seen God? One has only seen you know, human beings, God comes in the form of human beings and none of us have ever seen God. And if you think that we are lucky because we got those things, indeed we are lucky. But I also asked him, do you know, do you know how difficult it is to actually receive something of that magnitude? Have you ever thought that you need a lot of humility and a lot of courage to actually accept something from somebody else? Do you want to talk something about that? No, it is definitely humility. You need to act. Just, exactly. just you know, take what somebody offers you in very good faith and, and uh, out of sheer friendship and nothing else. And I think that's that's something that all of us have to be grateful for when we get it. And um, I, yeah, because because I think people imagine that anyone in trouble sees, is easily seeking help. But when they get it, they don't look at the person receiving it. They only look at the person giving the help, offering the help. And they don't look at the person giving the help. So, you know, a lot of courage uh, in, in saying that you don't have what you don't, what you want. And, and also accepting, you know, with humility when someone offers it to you. It's a very important thing and which, which a lot of people, you know, overlook. Fortunately, I started my business, my wedding planning business, a few years before this disaster hit us. So I actually had already begun earning my my own money. Uh, for the three years that he was there, before he ran away, he took that too. Every month he would come say, please, please give me some money, I have to pay some, uh, some, something, some expense, some this, some that. Never got it back in, in several lakhs, I would say, you know, lots, many, many lakhs. And towards the end, my business partner, Rekha, uh, she's Mr. Enron's niece actually and she stopped giving me money my share of, the, of whatever the money was she would hold it with her and say I'm not going to give it to you because if I give it to you that fellow's going to take it so you know people like that I mean I would never have thought of it and there was no question of taking offense if she said that because that's the most practical thing for her to have done so it was help you know even things like small things like that so where money what is what do I you have to have that 
humility and that sense of acceptance that yes, I have a problem, yes, I need a solution, and somebody is willing to come in and do it in the most uh, appropriate manner, in the most timely manner, and with absolutely no strings attached. Many of the help that she received in her life, many of it that we received, and many of it that you continue to receive, all of it comes without any strings attached. And in a way, I, I second Vani's point uh, over here that God comes in a human form, this, this, this formless, imaginary uh, source of high energy that we all look up to uh, when we are in distress particularly. Okay? That form comes in a human form to help at the most appropriate time to give you what you need, maybe not all that you want, but what you need. And often what you need comes to you not in the way you wanted it, but in the way life wants to present itself. So that's the beauty of life. At, the, at your worst stage when you're down, really down and out and you don't ex never expect it to be there, I think one of the things that ha does happen is you lose faith. And you're like, why did God do this? Like he said, why me? Why did, why did this happen? I'm a good person. I've never harmed anybody in my life. Never cheated, never done anything. Why did this happen to me? And I had a, an aunt and some people who said, Vidya, this is your karma. I got so angry when they told them that. Told me that I said, I used, unfortunately on that whole area, I used a couple of very bad words. And I said, stop that nonsense. What nonsense? Karma, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in afterlife. I don't. And I said, to hell with those stupid gods. What did they do for me? Yeah, I, I, not that I'm a puja park kind of person, but I do go to temples. I go to Tirupati every year. And I'm fairly spiritual. I go to Swami Paramatta's classes, which I've been going for many years, always studied Bhagavad Gita. But none of that has actually helped but in a situation like this. So listen, to help those stupid gods in my mind, it's always say, just be calm, wait, things will, things will turn around. Just don't, don't lose faith. And I was telling them a couple of incidents happened. One incident happened where the, so I'll take, I'll take that minute to quickly say that in the, in the context of faith, uh, it is again our expectation that we should not be given a life challenge. And when the challenge is thrown at us, despite our goodness, despite our integrity, then we question, is there uh, a justice? But life never promised any justice. Life has not told you that this is the way your life will be. And so you you have to understand that life asks nothing of life, so you don't ask anything in return. Don't seek, don't expect, because expectations bring agony. And when you are this way, then you are enjoying being alive. You are enjoying this whole beauty of this opportunity to go through an un unknown, unseen adventure. That's what she's gone through. That's what we're going through. That's what you're going through. Also, I did have one slightly, I won't say religious experience, but Mr. Manoj Santalia sent me to an astrologer who gave me, looked at the horoscopes and he said, don't worry, things will get sorted out. I just want you to uh, uh, put a, a shivalingam in your house and do a, a chest, whatever, abhishekam every day. So I said, you know, we have Vaishnavites. I immediately connected myself. I said, I apologize. I go to dargas and I go to churches. I pray everywhere. I find them. So I was driving home thinking, where am I going to get a shivalinga? Uh, about two hours later, I was living in Vithipuri for a short while. Mr. Murugapan, M.M. Murugapan, Murugapan, he had lent me that place to stay in for a short while. And so, he, so he, my neighbor called me and said, Vidya, you, when you moved out, you took everything, you left your shivalingam behind. This actually happened to me. So I said, TP, I, I never owned a Shivalingam in my life. I've had many Ganeshas because I love Ganesha. I have them everywhere in my house, but I don't have a Shiv. So she said, no, it's there. Please come and take it. And the staff of the building have been doing a uh, little puja for it. So I immediately zipped out to her house, to the pool, picked up the Shivalingam. It looks like a clay model made by a child. It does not look like anything you'll buy. I'm not saying some god came and put it there, but it came, appeared there out of the blue. It was certainly not mine. And it, it's not bought from a shop, it's made out of clay and uh, lying there. So I, I have it in my house and I do a little lampshake and a little lighting the lamp uh, every day since then. But that, that also gives you a little focus, I think. You know, just every day just to say thank you. You're not asking for anything, but just say thank you for whatever you've given me till today, looking after my children, keeping us healthy. So I only do thanks. We, never asked for it. We, we second that experience many times in my, in my book, I talk about it. Uh, these are signs 
that uh, you look for answers and life doesn't give you answers straight for, in a straightforward manner. This is just a sign. Absolutely. And when I rang my mother, she said, Vidya, I told you to hold on to the faith. This is your, your sign from somebody telling you, don't worry, there is, there is somebody <coughs> out there. You'll be you'll be provided provided for whatever, yeah, there, there is someone looking looking out for you. So this is a sign from somewhere. That's right. It may have been some for some <coughs> staff or somebody may have kept it there. Whatever, it came to me out of the blue. So, and not something that one would have bought from a shop even. It's extraordinary the story. And this <coughs> one, I'm not a, a deeply I'm a puja path person. I don't run to temples all the time, all of that. But having said that, you know, it's... Puja okay. rituals don't count. Yeah. Faith. It's how much faith do you trust the process of life with? Yeah. That's what it matters. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your childhood and uh, your uh, what value systems from your childhood do you think have come in handy in your dealing with the crisis today? You know, although we are both, my sister and I were both born into a royal family and uh, incredibly privileged lives we led, both of us. You but know, Vidya, yeah, did you have lives like the Princess Diaries, the little girl's dream? No, not quite. <laughs> but because we are born in the in the independent India, so we didn't really do all that royal stuff. But my family still have has palaces and forts and all well, a fort and several palaces in Vijayanagara. My cousin is Ashok Gajapati. He is the Maharaja now. My father's older brother was the Maharaja. So we certainly grew up in a uh, not entitled, definitely not entitled, but in privilege and having a sense of confidence as to who we are, both my sister and me. And my father was an extremely disciplined person. And he brought us up with extreme discipline, exercise, and in fact studies was, okay, do well in school, study, but go play tennis, go horse riding, uh, make sure you go swimming every day. You know, it was all to do with exercise. Six o'clock in the morning, we'd be out two or three times a week, rather than stadium here and there, run, going for a run. So I think that, that exercise and that discipline which comes with exercise, he was a very strict father. Spoiled my sister a little bit, but not me. But uh, you know, like if we start to eat a meal, you cannot get up from the table till your plate is empty. You cannot leave a morsel of food. You know, think so many, so many little so things. So the that humility, that yes. sense of gratitude, yes. and the discipline that you're talking about. The other day we, we met for coffee just two days ago, because we had met her in October to confirm the schedule. And we just wanted to catch up, and she's coming sweating from a from a from a site where she is hosting an event. Now, as somebody who, who owns the business, you don't have to do it necessarily. But there she was, on the ground doing it. So we both talked about the work ethic that she has. So that's so some work ethic, and I think my passion for me, my passion is exercise, fitness. I'm pretty much addicted to it, and I do such. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I go. I'm a bicycler. So on Sunday mornings, we go, I have a group of girls, we go bicycling 40 to 60 kilometers out on ECR. I, I, I'm a good swimmer, I grew up with a swimming pool, we have a swimming pool in my mother's house. And in those days, we must have been the only people with a private pool in our house. So I was always a good swimmer and I suddenly discovered a few years ago, I'm actually quite competitive. And I started taking part in masters, nationals, national masters, that's where we went to Bhopal to swim and winning lots of gold medals, I have to say. A friend of mine, of course, said that I'm getting the gold medals because I'm the only one in the pool. <laughs> but I'm, I'm enjoying that I'm a good horse rider. And now the last six years, trekking. I'm just uh, enjoying the trekking so much. Uh, Ladakh or uh, uh, Mount Kinabalu in eastern Malaysia. We went to, uh, or, you know, wherever you could think of Everest Base Camp in um, Annapurna. So, and now this year I have uh, Kilimanjaro in August and uh, uh, Machu Picchu, the Inca Trail in, in April, May. So that's a huge passion for us and fortunately my daughter shares that with me. So she's a very good trekker, very strong, very good trekker and she comes, we go together. I want to sum up that part about the values instilled in childhood. But since you're talking about fitness, hasn't staying fit helped you deal with the crisis? Oh, there's no question about it. When you, when you have a fit body, your mind is also calm and it's definitely there's, there is a connect between a fit body and a fit mind. There's no question about I it. Truly, I truly yeah, second I, it. Totally I, I personally had a tobacco habit. She's, she's aware that, yeah. of that for almost 20 years. Yeah. And then in 2004, uh, my doctor looked at all my uh, reports and said, Avis, you will not touch 40. You will uh, go before that because uh, you're overweight, you have high sugar levels, you your BP is high and you have a tobacco habit. And I was not drinking every day but I was drinking a lot. 
and then I went on a you know complete transformation program and lost 22 kilos in six months. And I always tell Vani. So I, I really I understand. I think it's mental discipline also. Exactly. Because you feel you if you get your body gets addicted to a certain amount of exercise, you you definitely need it. And the feel good factor is something. I mean, everyone knows it's the endorphins that come through your body when you're exercising, and also looking good helps. So, <laughs> right, absolutely. so that's also. I'm 65 years old, and I and I hope to be able to exercise at least for 20 more years. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. Be, give her a big hand. My mother is 87, and she still walks every morning an hour. She still drives her own car up and down from her farm, which is two hours, two hours away every week. She's driving back and forth, and pretty much out of control, anybody's control. She got caught for speeding, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> On PCR, near BGP, those fellows are hiding behind the tree to catch you, so she got caught for speeding also. <laughs> it's nice to have good role models, I think. I'll let Vani yeah. ask the next question, but before that, I just want to quickly summarize that part I had asked her about the childhood values. You know, in a, in a way, we are already prepared for what we are going to face. We are already prepared. There is a wiring that's already happened unknown to us. The only lesson I've learned from my dad, and fortunately things are so strained at, at, at my family because of the borrowing I did from them, that I don't get to spend as much time with my dad or talk to him. And whenever we speak, we talk about my inability and our inability to repair. It's very, very gut-wrenching. But the one thing he taught, taught us, and my brother and my sister, is to be truthful. And so when we came to this crisis, and creditor to whom we owed money felt pity for us, and he said, sir, why don't you take a fresh ration card, a fresh hand card, we give you another Aadhaar card, so we'll change your name, change your uh, identity, run away from this. Not this, let us get it. You know, only all third of real. And I remember telling him, thank you so much, but no thanks. We, we went bankrupt here, we face the situation here, we will stay and look at the problem in the eye, we are not running away. I think that comes from the values. Today, unfortunately, the same family calls thinks that we have cheated them, but that's that's part of life's play and we ought to learn to go with it. But I do understand when she says that her discipline that her father taught her, humility, don't leave a morsel of food on the plate, humility. These things, the gratitude, you know, the sense of gratitude, not entitled, but still a comfortable life. Certainly not entitled. And I think we, my sister and I grew up imagining our lives would be just like that. I had a lot of marriage proposals when I was growing up, most, and my father, because we are Rajputs, my father wanted someone from a Rajput family, so that's where we were looking, and I was, it was quite amusing. I was telling someone the other day, we were sitting in a group and chatting, and I said, you know, all my life, I wanted to marry a Maharaja and be a, have a title of a Maharani and I wanted my own fort and palace. So there was deathly silence for about, nobody knew what to say. <laughs> so then very quietly one voice said, you know all my life I wanted a 2 BHK. <laughs> so that's the, you can see the humor in that. <laughs> you know, uh, this is so true about your childhood values being ingrained in you and how they show up at the right time yes. when you need them in life. Uh, I was telling uh, Ram the other day, my mother uh, used to say this, you know, she, she was a Montessori teacher and she would say that whatever you want to teach your child, teach it between the age, from the time they are, they are born till the age of five. Uh, because whatever they have to learn for life, they learn in that age group. So. Give, give your child your all before they turn five because that's good. Whatever you give them is going to stay with them lifelong. And uh, you know, I think I uh, kind of imbibed a lot of what she said uh, and, and implemented that with my own children. So I want to ask you about your children. Uh, you mentioned that both your, both Viraj and your daughter are really, um, uh, you know, under, not just understanding, they support you, they, uh, you know, so. When, when things went wrong, how did you, uh, you know, break it to the children? Did you talk to them? Did you have conversations? Uh, I think I think there was a, we knew what was going on and we just became, we were helpless. We didn't know how to stop it, we didn't know how to, you know, I mean, I should have thrown him out a long, long time ago. I could have saved myself a lot of properties and like, but like my son said, it's all, it's all material things. 
But I think at the end of the day, if they are sick, we are with you and they are good kids, they have grown up. It's not like they were perfect children, but they grew up through the uh, through the, all the troubled childhood and they grew up into two good kids who are hardworking and earning their own money. Both of them have been, they don't take anything from us, they earn their own money. And my daughter is a horribly bossy girl, so she's taken over the family, whatever, you know, finances and everything, and she manages everything. So all those are good things, I think, for all of us as a, I'm sorry. So did you, I mean, uh, this is very important because uh, we found that, you know, during this crisis, uh, we, we realized that we had to talk to our children because children ask questions, you know. I mean, why can't my friends are our going, children much our children are much younger and my friends are going on a, a trip uh, to New York for a leadership program and why can't I go and, you know, my friends are buying so-and-so brand and why can't I buy those shoes and they asked you, those kind of questions. So, fortunately, my both my children are very grounded. Never, they're not into the name brands. They're not into any of those things. In fact, my son doesn't even have a car. They live, both live in Bombay. He doesn't even have a car. And I told him, Baba, I think you should buy a small car at least to go around. So he said, Mom, I don't need. He's a motorbiker. So he has several motorbikes. So he said, I don't date actresses or girlfriend or uh, or models. They can come on the bike with me. So <laughs> very simple answer. He's very grounded and you know. And he has a wonderful little girlfriend who's a, a, one of the finest stage actresses in, in India, a girl called Yuki. And I told him, don't ever lose this girl because she goes everywhere on the motorbike with him. <laughs> <laughs> she went to Ladakh, she went, she went biking on, in Scotland. She, they just went to Gujarat for 10 days on a motorbike. And it's horrifyingly scary, but that's what they do. <laughs> so this is interesting that uh, both, you know, both Bani's journey, which is actually our journey, and her conversations with her children, and her children giving her strength comes from a phenomenal amount of honesty in in a in a, in a family context, and I cannot uh, you know say less about it. You know, it's, it's extremely important to have honest conversations. I remember once when uh, I was going to be arrested uh, for uh, for for a complaint that had been filed against me, and a warrant was being served on me. I had to bring the children up to speed. My son was in New York, uh, in Denver at that time, and our daughter was here, and it was a very difficult conversation to tell them what an FIR was, what an arrest means, and there is no money to file for a bail application. So, if I'm gone, mom is going to lead this, and we've got to deal with this however long it takes. And at the end of it, it was I who broke down, not, not my two children. And you know, that gave me strength uh, that we were uh, dealing with people that had the ability, the resilience to stay. So you must be incredibly proud as a mom. To, I'm very, to very proud of them. Viraj has just done a wonderful series of, uh, with Shruti Harihara, uh, Harmony with Rahman series. Uh, uh, he's, so, a he's a cinematographer. He's a cinematographer. He's done some on work. Amazon Prime. So yeah, it's a good, very good yeah. series, and she's. Quit her. She worked for 15 years with corporate jobs and a year and a half ago said, that's it, I'm going to go find myself. I'm like, baby, where are you going? I'm going to South America. I'm like, you can't go that far away. I think I'll come with you. So she's like, mom, people don't take their mothers when they're trying to find themselves. <laughs> so come, come with me. So she just pushed off for seven months to South America by herself with a backpack. It was so terrifying. I gave up iced coffee for six months. <laughs> Took a month to bring her back safe. <laughs> Give up iced coffee. But having said that, I'm incredibly proud of what they have achieved and how they've dealt with. You know, it's it was like going down to the depths for us. Uh, it's. I mean, I'm not saying we were ever on the street or we were so poor that we didn't have money. None of that. We were still able to manage everything else. But and and clear some of the debts and things. But. Having said that, I think these two children were definitely a, a rock behind me. Totally like two rocks. And I, I, I'd like to just qualify that part. I think the, 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 uh, we, have, we have been through absolute penury and we understand that. But you don't have to be penniless to understand the value of loss. You know, loss by itself, pain by itself is unique. The context keeps changing. But on the Vedana Yirku Paraga, and you don't have, and it is beyond class, beyond strata of society, and it's it has to be dealt with. And such is the also I think in, in most of our lives, I mean adult life from when you're about seventeen or eighteen, I think most of us come to crossroads two or three times in your life. Not all the time, but certain crossroads where you have to make a choice. 
Do I go this way or do I go this way? And what you choose sometimes is the wrong decision. And then you think to yourself, is there some, is there really some karma? Is there, is this destiny that you made this choice and not that? My life could have been so much more different if I had, for instance, married somebody else or not chosen to go with this fellow. You know, so many things. So again, those choices I don't think are entirely left to your, it's not a, such a free choice. It's a bit confused in my, in my, I think way it's a combination of both. Yeah. You, you take a choice, you make a choice, like I'm often asked, did you, uh, you yes. know, she's often asked, did you guys not talk about it before walking out of a company uh, which was paying you 60% of your revenues, uh, you know, on, on the ground of ethics? Did you not talk among yourselves? Of course we spoke among ourselves. Of course we made some calculations. But everything blew up in our face and we're still dealing with it for 11 years now. So sometimes the evidence and data available in front of you forces you to make a choice. That's leadership. There's nothing wrong with it. And that data, that evidence, that mental tuning to make that choice is part of a larger inscrutable design. And you have nobody to blame except take responsibility for what has happened and say, come on, shit happens. I think one thing you said earlier is important. I think talking about when you're in a crisis, talking to your children if they're old enough, talking to your mother, talking to people who are around you to get advice. And I think the worst thing is to close up and think that, you know, the problem is going to go away if you just ignore it. It does not go away. It's, it's going to rise up and pick you at some point of time. So I think talking is very important, which is one thing I did not do during that time with my children. They were old enough. I could have told them, this is what's going on. What shall we do? As a family, we should have come together, which we did not do. And so talking always helps. Oh, yes, yes. Talking just it helps. I, I, I completely agree with that because this is exactly what we did. We, I found that conversations, even, even whether they could between us or with the children, was always been very helpful. So, has your view on marriage itself changed now? I uh, think I'm so happily single that I can't, <laughs> I can't, cannot imagine marrying anybody. I mean, as a, I think marriage is a, is going to be gone in another generation. I don't think people will need to be married. But having said that, I mean, if you have a good man and a good marriage and a good woman, I'm sure it's highly, uh, uh, you know, happy, gives you a lot of happiness and things. But I think... Uh, at the moment, I'm so happily single, I cannot hear. Someone told me, they are, you know, yeah, you still look quite good. Why don't you get to look, think about it? I'm like, I'm 65 years old. Anybody in my age group will be pretty, pretty, have some terrible habits, personal <laughs> habits. He might be bald, he may have a pot belly, and he may be really overweight. I want Ranjit Singh. <laughs> so, so I have to be worried. <laughs> So that's the, I, I think the, 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 the key operative word here is happiness. Vani and I are, are, are celebrating 30 years of living in tomorrow. <laughs> so and 30 years of living in. So 30, 30, 30, 30, 32 years of knowing each other. And I think our, our, we have stayed together not because we are married. I think we have stayed together because we are very honest friends. And yeah. we, we get along famously. And I think that's the, that's the beauty. So I think she is talking about being single and having good friends and being happy through the process and you can have a companion and be happy and gender doesn't matter so I think in, in, about, in about a year and not you know, in about another generation we, I think you're going to see a huge shift there. See both my children are unmarried and my son has actually been with the same girl for five years almost like a marriage. My mother told him, Virat, why don't you get married? Such a nice girl. He said, why, Amama? I'm so, we are so happy. So, so they, then she said, don't you want to live together? He said, no, I have a beautiful home. She has a lovely apartment. We're very happy. They have all got children. No, I, we don't want to have children. So this is a new uh, way of thinking. So I think... Uh, this, is, this is built on the foundation of happiness. Happiness, exactly. Population will come down Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next yeah, one. In, uh, you know, a little while ago, we spoke very briefly about uh, a grand design, uh, you know, playing out, and we don't realize it, you know. Amos often calls it the master plan. And he, he says, you know, uh, human beings are busy making plans, but the master plan has no flaws. Um, so, you know, uh, the other time, and we often laugh over this uh, scene in a particular movie, uh, which which plays often on TV. It's called Zindagi Na Bilegi Dobara. And most of you must have seen that film at least a couple of times because they play it so often on TV. 
and in one of those scenes, the three guys are uh, drunk, and uh, Hrithik is sitting there, and he says, you know, everything is written, everything is written, and to the extent that others get angry and try to hit and say, stop saying, everything is written, you know, you know, what do you think of that? Because it's certainly written, because there's no way I ever imagined my life would be. I thought I would be living happily ever after. I did want to marry somebody who, in those days, there was religion played a very big role in the very early 70s. And it was, so their second choice was an arranged marriage, which anyway I was prepared for. You know, we, I belong to a generation. We went to college. I mean, some of my, I can see a few of my friends here they, who wanted careers. And the only career you had was a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer. And the rest of us went to college through time pass to get married. That's all we, we went to college for. So, it's, you expect that's what your life is going to be. Just perfect. Go horse riding, play tennis, have a husband somewhere there and then live in this beautiful town and have this beautiful life. But it doesn't quite happen that way. And uh, you know something, Vidya, I was just thinking about it when you said, you set up Sumio, your wedding yes. planning in 2007. And all this happened in 2010. And so like, uh, you know, you, could, you had an identity of your own as a wedding planner, as you had work to do, I mean, although you said that you didn't, so you had work to do, which is very important because in those few months that I was in the traumatized state, my partner took care of a lot of things because I would be weeping the whole day. I would be lying in the bed and weeping helplessly. And nothing you can do, nothing about it. But I was like, I was a, like a, you know, a wreck for so many, so many but months. But isn't it beautiful that it was all set up and it Absolutely. was, you know, there was, a, there was a design. There was a grand design. Was a design. Actually, so, that was what I was trying to... Yeah. Yeah. There, is, there was a grand design. There is a design and I think we are all sitting here because of that grand design. So yeah. We are all you're together you're just talking about to hear what she's saying. What she's saying. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is part of a grand design. We can accept it, we can reject it, but that doesn't take away the design. Right. No, that's the that's the beauty of it. That's the destiny factor, that, which is so we as Indians we believe that believe in that quite a lot. Karma, destiny, whatever. It is. So you leave, you do your bit. Uh, if Sumyog had not been set up in 2007, uh, she might not have had a fall back. So life conspired to give her a conspiracy. Absolutely. I mean, to give her a crisis, but also conspired to give her a backup plan, which she could fall back on. And when when she cleared up, when she stopped moping and moaning, she found it. There for her, and that helped her a lot. Mariam Ram one day told, called, called me and said, Vidya, please stop it. Nobody wants to hear your stupid story anymore. You've told it to everyone. They're bored to tears. Stop. Please don't talk about this to anyone else. Because you needed somebody to, to hit you on the head stop and it. say that. Stop it. Get on with life. Be positive. You know, and happy. That's <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. How has your relationship with money changed? Yeah. I think it's a, uh, so it's a from inheritance to, uh, to privilege to earning today uh, to fighting for uh, what is right today. How is your relationship? Changed? I think it's a huge respect for money because I know I'm earning the money. I bought two cars with my own money. Everything is my own money, but I'm earning. You know, and it's a huge uh, feeling of uh, 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 self-respect. I think that hey, I'm able to do this and make a success of a business. I never imagined I would ever do business. Our families came from a background where anything to do with business was a little, you know, not really what we do kind of thing. It, it, that's the family background. You can't help it. They it was more on inheritance was, and, yeah, and estates on, and all of that. That's right? right. That's right. Even farming was considered very, very okay. But doing business was, oh my goodness. And I think I must be the first person in my generation to actually do a business in our entire family, both my mother's side and my father's side. People are politicians, they're, they're doing farming, they're you know, looking after their lands and estates, but nobody actually had a job or did a business. So I think our children's generation are the first ones who are all actually in the workforce and working. And I think in my generation, I must be the only person with a, I feel so, maybe there are one or two others, but I can't, uh, can't think of them offhand, but the only person who does a business. And it's a huge feeling of self-respect. You have success and it gives you enormous confidence. Absolutely. Enormous confidence. Absolutely. I think what we have learnt is we've learnt the value of money uh, in, in two ways. One is that it is important and the other is that it is impermanent. Uh, we come from a middle class background so going on to becoming a world class firm, earning that uh, at that time top draw revenues was a, was a very big high. 
but when we lost all of it, it was cathartic. So we've learned that it is important and it is impermanent, so respect it. Use it only when you have it and let it go when it goes. This is what we've learned. And therefore we invest in experiences rather than things. You know, it's, it's shifted big time. That's true and it doesn't make you a better person if you have uh, 5,000 crores in your bank account. It's, it's what you are as a person. And you know, one of the things I told my children when they were much younger, I said, see, we come from a background where we are a royal family. We are Rajput, Sisodhya Rajput, Suryavamshis. All of this is something to be very proud of. But that does not define you as a person. It's what you, how you behave and how you uh, deal with people, with what humility you can deal with people, how people respect you. That's far more important than uh, I'm, a, I'm a princess. You know, that's, that's just... Nice to be a princess, nothing wrong with it. I'm quite happy with that. But having said that, it's, there's so much more. This, you know, and my children love that lesson. A, a self, a self developed identity yes. is much better, right? Than one it, ever It adds. Uh, it, you don't ever lose your identity of being the uh, daughter of a, of a royal family, of being a princess, all of that. You don't need to lose it. But that's not, that's not, a, that's not you. What you present to the world, they don't care whether your uh, your grandfather was a king. It's how you are as a person and how you deal with people. Yeah. That's, that's you know, in Tamil, uh, Vidya, uh, they call money cell phone, and apparently it is so because it says cell phone, it says let's go. So it never stays in one place. Its its nature is to flow. Well, I would have liked for it to stay. <laughs> <laughs> See, everyone would have liked for it to stay, but its nature is to flow. I, I mean, I do have a lot of regrets, more than uh, properties and estates and farmlands and everything else. But I mean, I really miss my jewelry. I love jewelry. I love wearing it, and it gives me a deep trauma that I don't have it. I apologize for the stupid phone. Uh, and I went to a dinner party at uh, Mr. M. A. M. Ramaswamy's uh, house, actually. And uh, his daughter-in-law was at that party, and she was wearing my necklace. You have no issue. Obviously, this fellow has given it to some pawnbroker or something. And there's nobody else in the world who has that. It's an old Vijayanagaram piece with my sister, and I have the identical ones. Rose-cut diamonds. In fact, it's featured in one of the books of Usha Balakrishna. And I got so traumatized that day when I saw that. I actually left the party and went home. Because I couldn't bear to see her. It's not her fault, right? You can't blame her. She might have bought other things of mine also. But uh, it was a deeply traumatic moment and I for think me. that's the point that Vani was just yeah. making, sell more. Yeah. It is here today and it is gone tomorrow. tomorrow. And yeah. that's what, you know, what is yours today will be someone else's tomorrow yes. and will be someone else's day after tomorrow and such is the law of the universe. That's this is what the Gita says. You know? So this is the only part of the Gita that I know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is most relevant In to me. In case you think he knows all the Gita. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things one needs to look at is uh, also as part of your mental balance and things is to do some amount of philosophy, study a bit of philosophy. I believe in that. I'm a great devotee of, not not that kind of devotee, of Swami Paramahta. And I think he's a wonderful guru to teach him. He's not not religious at all. It's totally spiritual. And I, he has enormous classes too. And I think that's given me a lot of, uh, you know, how to deal with life, how to deal with, like you said, economy with the ups and downs. So much that... Uh, our Vedas and our Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, all of that teach. What is, what is work for, for us, religion. For us both, yes, that's, that spiritual uh, perspective is very, very important. What has additionally helped us both is an hour of silence that we practice, Mauna, and uh, it's, it's something that I you know, deeply believe in. <laughs> and it's in that Mauna that you learn the art of surrender. When, when you don't know what to do, you ask for a sign. A sign always comes. But it's now time, and the clock is showing me a sign that we must uh, pause here and open up the floor for questions with you. We do have a couple of more questions, but we'll come to them later. Uh, I'm going to time this, and uh, whoever has got the first question, you may ask uh, Vidya. Yes, uh, Madhu? Uh, have you heard the Jackie Vasudev? He's a good speaker, very good speaker. He's uh, amazing to listen to. That was a question, that was an answer, yes. Yes. How can you be so idiotic not to take care of your jewels? I totally agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it just, no. It just saved my jewelry. I mean, some of it were pieces. No, before your money, freedom. You yeah. should take care of it. 
It's I very, know. very important. I have Don't blame so, anybody. I have many you people cannot trust so even your so Okay, that was, that was a point and she's accepted it. I think we should I totally move on agree with you, ma'am. <laughs> totally. It's quoted by many people. All my aunts, everybody's quoted me. Oh, so it's not the first time you're here. Not at all. Oh, so we've, we've, we've also been admonished a few times in public for, <laughs> for, for, for situations like that. Next question, please. Do you have a question? Yes, yes. How, how, how trusting you? are you of your employees now? Employees, I... How trusting are you? I'm a very trusting person. I, I think I still continue to trust people. I still, like my business partner and I, I don't tech, ask her any questions about the financial, but that's me. I'm not that kind of person who's going to go and look at every bit of account. I trust her. She's my, she's my business partner. She's a dear friend. And I know that she's not going to uh, ever cheat me. And if she does... It's bad for her to have done it to me, but I, she's never going to do it. So I don't think I'm the kind of person who would not trust. It's very difficult to change your nature yes. too much, you know. It's yeah. basic. Basic, uh, intrinsic nature is like that, trusting. Maybe uh, in today's world a bit stupid, but... Uh, it's okay. You have to be cautious. I yeah, we have to say that. A little more cautious. Trust. You should trust, but be cautious. Be cautious. And I think the, the, one, 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 one minute, we have a question here. One person's behavior... Uh, should should not be generalized in the context of all humanity. We've 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 been always you know if I if you look at my story and Mani's story, my own mother calls me a chief. Now that doesn't make all mothers bad. That doesn't make the whole world bad. You know, there's so much compassion flowing in this world, uh, and uh, provided and and a lot of it can come and touch you, provided you ask for help. And we've never fought shy of that. So we've always felt that uh, there is a lot of humanity still alive there and otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here and talking. So one person's behavior cannot be applied in, gen in generalizing an entire community of people or a section of people. Most Either of the most, <laughs> most people majority are good. Of most people are good out there. You have to yeah. believe that completely. Yeah. There's no yeah. point. Your positive attitude is very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And one thing that comes through very clearly, I'm somebody who strongly believes in the power of friendship. When Harian Brown tells you that, you know, I have to use two Tirukkuran swords, you know, said, how it comes to you with a piece of clothing, a friend immediately you know, supports. Or when she told you we are tired of listening to go to tears. Another Puritender method, negative conveys and delete that Puritan. When somebody is, just because you are somebody's friend, just don't put up with their attitude. If you have to give them positivity to arrive, to make them come out of whatever they are facing, do that. Give it in straight words. So, so my question to you is, if you are in a situation to deal with a good friend who is going through a problem situation, would you be able to do what money would do to you? I hope that uh, none of my friends get into this situation yeah. ever. But having said that, I mean, I, I, I make a very good friend. I'm a very loyal and good friend, and I think if any of my friends came into that, definitely, I would be I would be there for us to stand by them. For sure. It's I very want, important. I want to add what Vijay uh, called me yesterday and told me. Vijay is our, uh, you know, her lawyer and our lawyer, and more a friend to both of us. He, he said that Vidya is a very good choice, as, as, as you guessed, because she has malice towards none. So, I can relate to... Also, in our, our situation in our Indian courts, it's a sense of immense frustration. I've been in, in the court, I go to the criminal court in Saidapet, because a domestic violence case we filed against this fellow. 2011, early 2011, this is 2019, nothing has happened so far. That fellow has not even appeared once in the court. I go every month and, and mark my attendance there. Nothing. There's no way. It's so hard to even get him to come and appear in the court. It's at this one year. There's been no judge in my court. So I'm nowadays I'm like a like a rock star over there. Be hugging all the crying girls and <laughs> because so many poor miserable women, you know, crying. I'll be don't worry. Hugging the mothers, saying don't shout, be calm. You know, things like that. I'll, I'll come to you. Ravi has got a question there. I think he. Uh, can, no, I know, but we'll go to Ravi first. But we have the reverse of the problem. We have we have several cases against us. We are the accused in all of them. We appear, but the complainants don't appear. So. It, it happens. You know, it's, it's, it's a weird situation, but uh, that's life. Yes, Ravi. Trust is there, but trust, but verify is, I think, is a 
word for everyone. Trust but verify. And especially for women, I think this message should get across. I am sure that it is too many of them around me even today. That's one. Another thing, have you become smarter financially now? <laughs> not at all. I think not at all. I am enjoying spending the money that I am earning, but otherwise not very smart either. No, but you should. My you daughter should. is there to take care, so I am not. Let her do it. Your, your daughter manages your, manages your money. The funds. Yes, do you something. believe in the laws that your past life? That is one. And how far do you believe that citing all what you went through? This has come because of the past life or not? When did it actually trigger in your mind? I actually got very angry with my aunt when she told me this is some past life karma. I got furious with her. I don't say, don't talk, talk all this bullshit to me. I don't believe this nonsense. Which we are in this world. What did I do to anybody or to this fellow that he had to come into my life and do all this? I'm not so convinced about this past life, to be honest. That's, that's, even though I study Vedanta and philosophy and all that, that's what they tell us. But I'm, I find it a little hard to believe. Uh, we were, very interestingly, we were talking about it over breakfast this morning in another context, and our answer is pretty much similar. Irikaro uruvarke khadandu portike ura kastamani. Idhar parasa pati yosi, chhe mara porda pati yosi. Yehi ke saar thale pora pono. Abey naamle desi. So we have something in Telugu, in Telugu called Kori Kilo. So I have a list of Kori Kilo for the next Janma. <laughs> you know. Uh, Okay, spirituality is all about being in the now. Right. So it's all we have is this moment. Aane wala pal jaane wala hai. Ho sake to isme zindagi bita lo. So pal ye jo jaane wala hai. Ma'am, the word korikulu made me go back to my question again, though I raised my hand earlier. Yeah. Uh, from being here, what are you looking forward to? What are your aspirations? For the next 20 years, I'm 65, so we're looking at up to 85. I think continuing my fitness level as much as I am now and hoping that I'll be able to continue trekking also at least till somewhere halfway there. And just having a good life where I can, you know, live well, you know, and my children do well and, and live well. And all of us somehow survive. That fellow's not gone away. He's still out there waiting to do some more stuff to us. So I'm just hoping that that's my prayer to, go, to my God every day saying, Protect us from this wicked fellow. That's all. I don't ask for anything. Are you not getting fit to catch him in mug? <laughs> if, I, if I caught him, I'd kick the shit out of him and maybe shoot him also. <laughs> but, yes. but, you know, what's your name? Hema. Hema. Thank you, Hema, for that uh, question and for that answer. I think uh, one point I'd like to tell you, Chandra uh, Mori. <laughs> the point I'd like to amplify is a key to happiness, an antidote to worrying, is to develop a phys physical fitness regimen and some quality me time, which is the Mauna practice that we did, uh, which is the uh, Vedanta practice that she is doing, you know, exercise, exercise, the, exercise. the the, uh, the uh, philosophy point she brought about. All this comes from me time. It can be music, it can be anything. But the moment you embrace these pause and reflect opportunities, uh, you will do incredibly better uh, than what you're doing currently. You know, that means cooking. <laughs> Therapeutic. Therapeutic. Yes, sir. Actually, you know, I had a question, but you already answered. <laughs> what is the question? <laughs> Still, I want to put the question. Please See, do. you attend a lot of parties. Yes. You attend a lot of weddings. Lots. Why freak you happen to meet that man? How, what will be your response? <laughs> <laughs> or impression? <laughs> that question I had. <laughs> what you have answered? See, he looks a bit like uh, a combination of Ranveer Singh and Hrithik Roshan. I certainly look at him. <laughs> Otherwise, he's not going to get a second look at look from me. No, no, I think he was asking about your Oh, that fellow. Sorry, I'm will get it from me. And I hope my children are there. My son will beat the shit out of them. Yes, yes. How did you tolerate him so long? <laughs> Sorry? How, How did you tolerate him so long? No, because he was not, he was like Dr. Nagaswamy told me, there are people who are social psychopaths. He was a psychopath. Towards the end, my mother was actually afraid for my life because he might have, he was so desperate to finish off my boat club road property and that was the last of the two properties that were left after all that went. And I think he would have been quite happy to have uh, maybe, you know, in the night, bother you, do anything. So actually she was really worried. 
So when you're dealing with a social, you know, and if you read about a psychopath, there are people who have immense patience. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a long-term planning that they do, which is what this fellow, this fellow yes. did. It's a, I read about it recently. In fact, I cut out that thing from the newspaper because every quality they said uh, was him. Yeah, they are one person to the population. So, they are yes. different from social parts. We'll take this big text is off. We are running out of time. Yeah. I'm going to let Bani do a quick... Uh, you want to add anything here? No, Before just I that I want to say maybe we can make a Bollywood movie on your life. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't. I have uh, friends with Javid Saab and Anil Kapoor and both of them said, please, we cannot make a story on your life. It's too dark and depressing and boring. We don't want... Nobody wants to hear this I think story. we should make them watch this video. <laughs> you know, they, they need to see See the cult that we are learning here, which which can inspire a lot of people. I think uh, it's it, you know for me personally uh, and for Mani, I speak for her as well. Uh, this conversation uh, is something very similar to the, the the journey that we've been having. But for many people out there and those who watch this video later on, I think we need to understand that everyone goes through their uh, allowance of shit. We can call it. Yes. She started with yeah. "shit happens," so I'm, I'm using that, uh, you know, phrase to close it. Uh, everyone has their uh, elements, uh, and uh, we think that the others don't have problems. So people who live in work club, people who uh, uh, live, uh, you know, are globe trotting. We think they don't have a problem. I think all of us are given our share of challenges, <coughs> and how we deal with them makes all the difference. For me, I lean today uh, first on Mary Oliver again because I've become a, become a new fan of hers uh, post her passing away. Uh, so Mary Oliver uh, says something which kind of uh, sums up what Vidya has been talking about. Mary says that what I want in life is to be dazzled. What I want in life is to be dazzled, to cast away the weight of facts weight of facts, the weight of reality, to cast it away, and to just maybe float a little above this difficult world. So beautiful. So I want to be dazzled, I want to cast away the facts, the weight of reality, and I want to float a little above <coughs> this difficult world, which is what the Gita says, be in this world and yet be above it. Be in the world but not of it, says the Bible. And I think a journey like hers inspires us to consider that option. judgment And we got to learn to deal with all of it. And which is why I close as always with Rumi and I'll repeat my favorite quote from him, which is, take sips of the pure wine being poured. Never mind that you have been given a dirty cup. Her dirty cup, our dirty cup are evidences that there is a lot of life through a crisis and after a crisis. That is where I would like to end it. Very well so, I want to thank Vidya for being here and sharing in a very candid manner, in a very yes, candid yes, manner, in a very humorous manner. It was a pleasure and thank you all of you very for coming and listening to this story. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank you everybody for being here. Please join us on the last Saturday of this month for the next edition of List Catchers, uh, which features Vedant Bharatwaj and Sunil Gargan, the two musicians. Then on the 9th of March, we have Uma Satinarayan, the dancer, and Shobha Warrior, over there, the writer. Interestingly, um, she's with us today. She's with us today. Yes. Both of them, she has a fascinating story as well. Both of them will be with us for the next edition of the Happiness Conversations. It is 8.29 right now, and we will let you go and pick up your glass of wine so that you can look at it and remember Rumi, remember this conversation, but don't complain about the dirty cup. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.